All right, so let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, and I, I want to talk to you about a prayer for 2024. A prayer for 2024. You know, I want to set you up for success as we go to 2024. And, you know, whatever happened, good, bad, or ugly in 2023, just leave it here. Just leave it here. Can, can we do that? Just leave it here. And don't take it with you into a brand new year because it will limit you. It will restrict you. It could hinder you from what God wants to do in a brand new year, brand new doors, brand new opportunities. Amen, somebody? Brand new level. I want to go to a new level with God. I want to know him like I've never known him before. I want to experience him. I want to taste more of him. I want to see him work in your life like never before. Amen. So I want to talk to you about a prayer that I want you to pray over yourself, and it's called the Prayers of Paul. I took a course in college. All it was over, the prayers of the Apostle Paul. There are books in my library titled The Prayers of the Apostle Paul. There are prayers that he prayed from Romans, Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians that Paul prayed. Several of those books, there are prayers of Paul that he wrote while he was in prison, okay? And there are there, those prayers, you and I are to personalize them. When you pray the word, you get answers. When you pray the word, it's the will of God. You don't have to ever question, well, is it God's will when you pray the word? I'm going to say that again. You never have to hesitate or question or wonder or waver when you're praying the word. I want to give you a pattern. I want to give you a template to pray over 2024 that actually taps into our motto for next year. God has more in store for you in 2024. Okay, pastor, we can hoop and holler over that, but how do I tap into it? I'm glad you asked that question because I'm going to show you today how to tap into the more that God has in store for you in 2024. Is that all right with everybody? Okay, so let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Let's just begin, guys. Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to read nine verses here, and then we're going to summarize it, okay? But yeah, guys, stay with that. Go right back to that. Ephesians, where you were before. Ephesians chapter 1 through 3 tells us, the first three chapters of Ephesians tells us our three things. Number one, our position. We need to know who we are in Christ. The book of Ephesians is all about our identity, our position, who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ, what we can do in Christ. The first three chapters, they talk about your position. The, the last few chapters, three chapters, talk about practical living it out. The first three chapters are position. The last three chapters, the practical way to apply it and live it out. So let's look at number two, guys. It talks about our privileges. Chapter one, two, and three talks about our position as Christians. You have to be strong to be a Christian. You have to be strong to be a Christian. You can't be wimpy and be a believer. All right? So we find out our position in Christ. In fact, the book of Ephesians is all about your riches in Christ. It's all about your riches in Christ. The book of Ephesians is the New Testament of the Old Testament, the book of Joshua. The book of Ephesians is the New Testament book that parallels with the Old Testament book of Joshua. The book of Ephesians, chapter 1, 2, and 3, talks about your position. Number two, your privileges. Your privileges. And number three, your power. So it talks about what? I forgot already. Your position. Number two, your... And number three, your power. So you need to know that to be an overcoming Christian in 2024. You need to know your position, who you are. You need to know your privileges, what you have, and you need to know the power that's in you as a believer, what you can do, who you are, what you have, and what you can do. And when you understand that, you walk with boldness, you walk with confidence, you walk into the unknown, unafraid. You walk into, this is a word for somebody, you walk into the unknown, unafraid. 
You walk into the unknown unafraid. You endure the unendurable. You endure the unendurable. Some of you have lost a loved one this year, a job, your health. Some of you have lost relationships this year, your retirement this year. And what you're going through is unbearable. God knows all about it, and he's giving you power to endure the unendurable and come out of it a victor. Well, let's don't patty cake. Let's give the Lord a big praise. Come on, clap your hands, half you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. When you know your position, this is worth breath in your teeth and flossing. I hope you did. Your neighbor hopes you did too, amen. But when you know your position and you know your privileges and you know your power, then you can face anything. You can overcome anything. You can go through anything. If I could give you a life hack, if I could give you a like hack, what is that? Make life easier for you? If we could go back in my lifetime, when I gave my heart to Christ at 11, if I could have a life hack that would have made my life easier, I wish I would have known when I was a teenager, my position, my privileges, and my power as a Christian. Come on, somebody. Life hack. What's that? Things that give you, make life easier. My life would have been easier if I had this revelation a lot sooner than when I got it. All right, next slide, guys, next slide. So Ephesians 1, now we're going to go through nine verses. We're going to pull out principles, so stay with me now. God's going to talk to you through his word. I just wish God would talk to me. He is right now. He's using me as an instrument to talk to you through his word. I wish I could just see God. You see God in his word. Just like you get my book, God is for you, you'll see me in that book. Who I am, my personality, my background, experiences, and why I am who I am today. Same thing with the Bible. It's what it does for you and God. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So not all the saints are faithful. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Y'all are faithful, amen? Okay. But not, uh, evidently, there's a difference between saints and ain'ts. Okay, we'll move right along, praise the Lord. Let's see if the next one goes over better. Verse 2. Grace be to you and peace, oh, I like that, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, there we have two of the Trinity right there, God the Father and God the Son. Now, I want to bring out to you something real quick. We don't have time to camp there. But do you know that God was never referred to as a father in the Old Testament? Only in the New Testament. Because, because God in the Old Testament, you check it out, he was referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was never referred to as a father until the new covenant, until Jesus died on the cross, until the church was born on the day of Pentecost. And now he has a family, and you are the family of God. And he is not only God, he wants to be your father. Oh, I like it. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father. Maybe you had an ugly father who was mean. Maybe you had a father who wasn't dependable. Maybe you had a bad relationship with your father. Maybe you grew up with no father. Well, the good news is when you come into the family of God, you get the father of all fathers. Oh, hallelujah. Verse 3. Just pulling out principles. Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have, this is past tense, blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, I want to bring something out from this verse, okay? Now, I have, but my text is Ephesians 3. We haven't got there yet. But I'm setting you up for success. I'm just showing you who you are, what you have, what you can do. I'm showing you your position, your privileges, and your power. And when you know that, that's a life hack. When you know that, it gets easier. When you know that, you face the unknown unafraid. You face tomorrow with faith and not fear. Okay? 
So blessed be the God and Father, never called Father in the Old Testament, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, didn't become a father until there was a family, and that family was born out of the church in Acts chapter 2. Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Question, where are our blessings? In, it's not a trick question. Where are our blessings? Okay, so our blessings are in heavenly places. Who else is in heavenly places? The devil and demons. It's not talking about heaven. It's talking about heavenly places, the heavens. Who's the prince and the power of the atmosphere? Satan. What is his organization? Demons and demonic power. So notice that he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings, but where are they? They're in the heavenlies. So what are you going to have to do to get them? Battle. They're not going to fall in your lap. It's not going to get easy, tiptoe through the tulips, right? Just because I became a Christian. Oh, just because I became a Christian, I'm going to be blessed? No. Just because I became a Christian, all the promises are mine? No. You're going to have to battle because your blessings are in the atmosphere. Your blessings are in the heavenlies, or we could say the promised land. In the book of Joshua, they had to fight the giants to possess what was theirs in the promised land. All the blessings of our, are, are given to us, but there's an enemy standing between your blessing and you, and it's the booger man, dragon breath, the devil, right? It's the devil and demons that stand between you and your healing, you and your breakthrough, you and your victory, you and your finances, you and the right mate, you and your parenting skills, you and your raise, you and your increase, you. There's the enemy. Now, here's a good quote from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said, there's no question God wants us to have his best. The question is, do we know how painful it will be to possess them? C.S. Lewis, no question. God wants us to have his very best. Question, do I know how painful it's going to be? The battles I'll have to fight, the armor I'll need to wear, the prayer language I'll need to pray, the 21 day of fasting in jail. Oh, I slipped that in there, didn't I? Do I understand the battle I'm going to have to go through for the blessings of the Lord that Jesus bought and paid for me? I think a lot of Christians, they don't understand that. And they get born again and things are hunky dory. You know what that means in the Greek, right? Hunky dory. Things are hunky dory. And then all of a sudden things start to get rough and they begin to question God, question the word, question the church question Christians, question their faith. My brother and sister, your blessings uh, from the Lord, there's somebody standing in the heavenlies, prince of powers, right? Spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, right? Four categories in Ephesians 6 that stand between you and what God wants to give you. You're going to have to fight for your healing, fight for your family, fight for your breakthrough, fight for your peace, fight for your joy. Just from that verse, we could go home now, amen. Verse four, well, that should set somebody free. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Oh my goodness, you're here on purpose for a purpose. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now that holy and without blame, now we're doing expository teaching, verse by verse, pulling out a principle, or application, okay? So he's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be what? Holy and without what? Before, oh, you blame, you be lame. Before him in love. Now, I just want to throw this out. This is just a little revelation. Uh, why should we be holy and blame before him? Because he wants us to see him. Did you know in the Beatitudes that I taught you last weekend in Matthew 5, it says, blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. If I want to see more of God, I have to become more pure and less sin in my life. See how quiet it's getting right now? Come on, we're all in the same boat. Amen. 
All right. But notice, that's why he put that in there, not to put us down, not to say we got to be perfect, but we got to pursue him. We, we want to have less sin in our life and more of God in our life, and we get more of God in our life by living a holy life. Blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they will see God. Oh, um, I didn't go over too good, Lord. Let's keep going. Verse 5, verse 5. Having predestinated us, now, are you picking something up? Because you're smarter than that 11 o'clock service. Now, are you all picking something up? All the us's, blessed us, chosen us, predestinated us, adopted us. What am I giving you? Your privileges. But when you know this and walk in this, you're not going to want to sin. You're not going to want to go back with the old crowd. You're not going to want to hang around the, those who chew and do and go with girls that do. You're not going to want to do that. Come on, somebody. When you get an idea of who you are, your position, what you have, your privileges, and the power you have, you, you face the future unafraid. You, you walk through what's unbearable. It, 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 it's unendurable. You endure it. You go through it. You see the pain has a purpose, right? And you got to go through the pain to get the promise. Oh, praise the Lord having predestinated us and adopted us by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Why did God save us? Because he wanted us. It was his good pleasure. It was his will. He wants you. He loves you. He has a plan for you. I'm talking to somebody online right now. God God sent his son to die for you and me because he wants you. You may be an outcast. You may be a misfit. You may be not accepted. He has accepted you. You may feel like your life is worthless. He predestinated you according to the good pleasure of his will. Verse 6, verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has, oh, here's another us. He has made us. Whoa, you're not junk. God don't make junk, right? And then he accepted us. Are you seeing all the us's? You need to circle that. Mark that. Because that's your, that's your position. That's your privileges. That gives you power. To the praise of the glory of his grace, when he has made us, he accepted us in the beloved. Verse 7. Verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. He redeemed us. And the forgiveness, he forgives us according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians is all about our riches in Christ. The book of Ephesians, homework, next 30 days, read the book of Ephesians. Read it through different paraphrases and translations and let God talk to you and may you see God in a different picture than you've ever seen him before. To the riches of his grace, the book of Ephesians is all about your riches in Christ. Verse 8, wherein he has abounded toward us. There's another us. Wisdom and prudence. Two different things. Wisdom and prudence. Wow. He's given us wisdom and he's given us prudence. Wow. When you get wisdom, the Bible says in your right hand is a long, strong life. In your left hand is riches and honor and favor. And what did God give us? Wisdom. And then he gave us prudence. Prudence is knowing the right time to apply the wisdom. Prudence is foresight and knowing the timing to apply the knowledge God's given to you, which is called wisdom. Can we have a praise break? Come on, can we thank him? Oh, come on, somebody. Oh, every time I get a chance, I'm going to praise him. Verse 9, verse 9. Having made known unto us, there's another us, the mystery of his will. According to his good pleasure, he did it because he wanted to. He did it because he wants us. Good pleasure in which he has purposed in himself. Question, what is the mystery? I want to know the mystery, God. Have I made known unto us the mystery of his will? I want to know what the mystery is. I want to know what was hidden to all those in the Old Testament. I, I want to know what they didn't see. I want to know what they didn't know in the Old Testament. I want to know, Paul, you're writing this in a prison cell. 
I, I want to know what's that mystery you're talking about that was revealed in the New Testament that no one in the Old Testament even had a clue about this mystery. God, what is this? This is your will, God. This is your plan, God. This is your purpose, God. This is important to you, God. I want to know what it is, God. What's the mystery? I'm glad you all asked that question. Let's go to the next slide. Should be first Corinthians. Well, okay, let's read this. He's blessed us. Can you all say that? Blessed us. Next guys. He's chosen us. Say that. So he's blessed us. He's chosen us. Now, why am I having you say it? Man, we're new to this church and boy, you guys are weird. You're always talking out loud because you tend to believe yourself more than me. So if I can get you to say it, you'll believe it more than if I just say it. And my job is to get you to believe it. Okay. So he what? He blessed us and then he's chosen us. Next guys quickly predestined. Okay. I'm not going to say it. I want to have you all say it. Okay. What did he do? He and, and the next, what did he do? And the next, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. The next, what did he do? Oh, purchased us. And then what? Made known to us the mystery. I, I want to know what that mystery is. We're supposed to know what that mystery is. That mystery is the will of God, the plan of God that was before the foundation of the world. But no one in the Old Testament had a clue about it. It was only revealed in the New Testament. What is that mystery? Let's go to that, guys. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32. Oh, Shazam. To quote Gomer Pyle, that famous theologian. Look at this. Give non-offense to three kinds of people. Did you know that a lot of people interpret the Bible incorrectly because they don't know the Bible was written to three people groups? It was written to three people groups that when you interpret the Bible, that some of it was written for the Jew, some of it was written for the Gentile, and some was written to the third group, the church. What is the mystery? The church, the church of the living God. That's why, you know, you and I honor the church. Jesus died for the church. He said, I will build my church. We shouldn't take it laxadaisia. It doesn't matter. Anything else I have to do, I'll do first, and the church is last. Wrong. Wrong. Jesus died for the church. Jesus said, I will build my church. When I interpret the Bible, some of those scriptures in the Old Testament was to the Jewish people. Other scriptures were to the Gentile. Others in the New Testament was written to the mystery. They didn't know anything about the church. You don't see the church mentioned in the Old Testament, only in the New Testament, because the church wasn't born until the book of Acts chapter two on the day of Pentecost. And the church was born. That was the mystery hidden from the ages. That was God's plan. Can I put it down? Make it real simple. He wanted a family. He wanted a family of sons and daughters, and he wanted to be a father to that family. So when you interpret the Bible, you, when you read the Bible in the one year Bible, you got to look at the context, what was written to the Jewish people. For example, the 144,000 in the book of Revelation is to the Jewish nation, not the Gentile. Matthew 24, many of the things that were written there about the last days was written to Israel. The Jewish people, not the Gentile or the church. So you have to, when you study the Bible, you got to know what you're talking about. You got to understand how the big picture when you're interpreting scripture. And so the mystery was the church. Man, I got to hustle. I got to hustle. Y'all praying for me to hustle. Okay, keep going, guys. Next slide. All right. Jew, Gentile, and the church. Next slide. Next slide. So no question God wants his best for us. The question is, C.S. Lewis, how painful is it going to be? For me to be here after 40 years, it's been painful. Come on, somebody. All right? But you know what? The, the gain was worth the pain to see you sitting out here today, your family, your loved ones, you serving God, living an abundant life, knowing God like that was worth all the pain I've gone through in 40 years. No pain, no gain. Come on, somebody. It's not going to be dropped in our lap. We got to fight the good fight of faith, right? So the question is, how painful is it going to be? 
All right, next slide, guys, next slide. Ephesians 3, verse 13. You know what? I don't think I'm going to get this done today. I think I'm going to have to pick this up. Same bat channel, same bat time. Come on, Batman, you ever watch that series? Okay, so, so look at this. Ephesians 3, 13. This is actually my text, and this is the prayer. Ephesians 3, 13, as the team comes, verse 21. Ephesians 3, verse 13 through 21 is a, is a prayer of Paul. This is what I want you all to begin to pray personally. I pray this over you every day. Did you know that? I do. And you need to pray it and put your name in there because it's going to set you up for more in 24. Not just preaching about it, hooping and hollering about it, but I'm going to show you how to tap in and access, access the more that God has for you. So this is a prayer of Paul that you and I are to personalize and pray every day of our life. This is a prayer you can pray every day. When you pray the word, you're praying the will of God. So notice it starts off with verse 13, goes all the way to verse 21. We were going to go verse by verse, but I don't want your roast to burn. Who cooks roast anymore during praise God? I don't want your Mac to have an attack on the way home. So, so, so look at this though. Wherefore I desire, this is Paul in prison. He said, I desire that you don't give up. I desire that you don't quit. I desire when it gets hard, you don't question God, the promises. I desire that you don't give in when it takes longer than you think. I desire that when people offend you, you won't hold on to it from 23, take it into 24. I desire that you won't faint at the many tribulations, which if you respond correctly, it'll be for your glory. Principle, if I respond correctly, this too shall pass. I can endure the unendurable. When I know what I'm going through is temporary, I can endure the unendurable. I can get through what I'm going through and come out on the other side, blessed her. Y'all forgive me for my English, amen, you English teachers. Wherefore, I desire that you don't quit, that you don't give up, that you don't do less, that you don't waver at my tribulations, which is for you, which is for your glory. If I respond correctly to the adversity, it will advance me. If I, if I respond correctly to pain, it will promote me. If I respond correctly to what I'm going through, God will take everything I'm going through and turn it around for your good. Come on, somebody. All right. So now, what is he going to do? He said, I don't want you to faint. I don't want you to give up. So he talks to them about the ministry of prayer. The ministry of prayer. Oh, I love this. The ministry of prayer. Prayer is a ministry. Okay? So guys, go all the way to the end. All the way to the end. And we'll pick this up next time. But look at verse 21. Or verse 20. Go all the way to verse 20. This is the verse we all like. Look at this prayer. Now unto him that is able in 2024 to do exceedingly, abundantly, much more than you could ask. This is a prayer. This is a part of the prayer that started at verse 13. You pray this prayer every day. It becomes revelation to you, and you'll begin to access all the more God has in store for you in 2024. Now unto him, God, He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all I can ask, ask for more, think for more, believe for more. That means you're going to have to do more. You're going to have to give more. You're going to have to serve more. You're going to have to pray more. Oh, I got a good crowd on the right-hand side. I'm praying for y'all over there. To the power that's working in me. Notice what God can do is limited by the power in you. What God can do is limited by the power that's in you. And with that, to be continued. I'm done. Did you get anything today? Come on, let's thank God for the word. Come on, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for the word. Woo Riches in Christ, the book of Ephesians, the prayer of Paul, Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one looking, everybody online. Christians are praying. Wow, I've been talking to you for the last 40 minutes. And what, you, what you're watching isn't an accident. God is for you. 
God loves you. He not only wants to be your God, he wants to be your father. And he wants you to be in his family. Let him do it today. Let him be your God. Join his family. You say, but pastor, will God forgive me? Oh, we just read it. He'll redeem you. He'll forgive you. He'll accept you. He'll bless you. He has predestinated you. He wants to reveal the mystery to you. He wants to give you wisdom and prudence, all the above, all those privileges. But you have to open your heart. You have to let him in. Let God in and let God be God. This is the last sermon of the year. I've saved the best for last to set you up. Don't leave this year the same. Don't leave this year the same. You see, Pastor, pray for me. I want to make Jesus Lord of my life. This is online. You say, Pastor, I want to surrender my life, not to religion, but God. I want to give God my life. I want to serve God for the rest of my life. Pray for me. If that's you, punch the button on your iPad, computer, your cell phone. If you need prayer, we have live people. They're in the metaverse, virtual reality. I mean, we're everywhere. We have live people ready to pray with you right now. Here in this room, out in the lobby, the Rock Express, heads are bowed. You say, Pastor, I don't want to leave this year the same. Pastor, I get it. I've seen God in the scripture today. I've seen God in a different picture. I have a different perspective of God. I've seen God. I've heard God. He's talking to me through the scripture. Pastor, I want to give my life to God. I want to serve God for the rest of my life. I want to go into 2024, a believer, a Christian, for God, serving him, giving him my life. If it's the first time or a reset, nobody's going to embarrass you, but faith is an act and all of heaven is watching. I believe your loved ones are watching. I believe those who have gone on to heaven before, they know when you become a Christian. I believe that. That's Hebrews chapter 12. But you say, Pastor, pray for me. Pray for me. Just lift your hand up right now, right where you're at, and every section, just wave it at me, would you please? No one's going to embarrass you. Nobody's going to come to you, but you got to do something. Faith is an act. Lift your hand up high. Wave it at me. God bless you. God bless you. Don't miss this moment. This has been very special today. This has been very special. You can put your hands down. Church, let's help them. Let's pray this prayer. Everybody out loud, say it with me. You're leading people to Christ right now. You're leading them to a God who's for them, helping them discover his purpose for their life. Say it with me. Heavenly Father, I am a sinner. I repent. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He died for me, and he rose again. Jesus Come into my heart. Come into my life. I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and take my life and make a difference. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching this week's message. One way for you to connect here at Church on the Rock is through GoTrack. We have a four-step process that you can take online anytime. You can find the GoTrack classes at cotr.org slash GoTrack. And if you want to know all the incredible things we have here at Church on the Rock, make sure to visit our website at cotr.org. And never forget, God is for you.